Let me take you back to my 21st birthday. We're in my hometown in Minnesota, and the same total wine I had been kicked out of a few months earlier for being under 21. I had no idea what I was looking for or where to find it. But I now had my golden ticket in hand. Literally. I had a yellow sheet of paper stating that I was 21 and that my real driver's license would be mailed to me in two weeks. Eventually, I found my way through the many rows of different types of bottles and cans until I found the whiskey. Now, I had been watching whiskey reviews for a short while before turning 21 with a friend of mine because we both liked the idea of drinking whiskey. So, I knew a handful of names, but in a total wine, I was easily overwhelmed. I quickly realized that the little money I had meant that I had to look at the lower shelves. That's where I noticed a box with a name I actually recognized. I didn't know anything about what it tasted like or if I would enjoy it, but I remembered the fantastic story surrounding that name. A tale of how everything that could go wrong does go wrong in the harshest environment on the planet. That was what made me purchase my first bottle of whiskey. My name is Ryan Heinzen, and I'm now a whiskey sommelier, and I've been working in a whiskey bar in Tennessee for the past two years. There's some bar patrons who still come in and throw back a shot, but it's the regulars I'm more interested in. Many of them would tell you that I've helped to teach them about whiskey, and even their own taste, but I've learned even more valuable lessons from them these customers have shown me that the experience of a drink is just as important as what's in the glass. Now, some bartenders have an amazing flair for physical feats, tossing and spinning a bottle around, all while creating a fantastic drink and filling their patrons with a sense of wonderment. I can't do that. I've never been the kind of person who seeks a spotlight, but I do like to think I have a flair for storytelling. And it turns out, most people are bad at remembering the subtle differences in tasting notes between two similar bottles of whiskey. But just like me, they do remember a good story. Behind every bottle is hundreds of stories. Every step starting from growing grain until it reaches your glass, this spirit is collecting experiences and stories that it would love to tell you. It's my goal to sift through these stories, find the most meaningful, and bring them forward to your attention. This isn't another whiskey review channel or show. This is pure storytelling. I won't analyze every detailed tasting note of the spirit in the bottle. Instead, I'll dive into the details of the spirit behind the bottle. And this is the spirit of Shackleton. For this story, we jump back to the year 1914. Charlie Chaplin has just made his first debut in film. The Ford Motor Company paid $5 for a whole eight-hour workday. Archduke Franz Ferdinand has been assassinated, which will ultimately result in the First World War. And most important to this story, we're in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. This would test the physical and mental limits of those who dared to push the boundaries of the unknown, but resulted in the mapping of the continent's coastline and findings that would keep the scientific community busy for decades. The main goal of many of these expeditions, however, wasn't for science. It was for the glory. The glory of being the first person to reach the South Pole. This is the motivation of our story's hero, Sir Ernest Shackleton. There's only one problem. The South Pole has already been reached at this point. It was reached three years ago. Roald Amundsen has already succeeded. Sure, Shackleton had his shot back in 1907 with a ship aptly named the Nimrod and trying to use ponies, <laughs> which didn't work. And somehow, it still got him closer than anyone had come before. But not quite to the pole. His record stood for less than three years. So now, what's a brave explorer who's been training for Arctic conditions supposed to do? Climb a mountain? 
No, not Shackleton. He's creative and knows exactly how he's going to one-up Amundsen. He's going to attempt to go through the pole to the other side of that giant sheet of ice, all in a straight line. The journey became known as the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, which remained as Shackleton declared to be the one great main objective of Antarctic journeyings. It is worth saying that this was chosen by Shackleton, and both the name and the quote were intended to help sell the idea of grandeur that was all very necessary for the first hurdle of the expedition. Fundraising Shackleton estimated that this monumental journey would require 50,000 pounds, which is equivalent to over six and a half million dollars today. And that would only be enough to fund the most basic version of his plan. To acquire this funding, Shackleton pleaded with the British government. And, thanks to his previous expeditions being so well known at the time, he also gained the attention of wealthy individuals who would help back his plan. It's worth pointing out as well that in this time period, Antarctic explorers were their equivalent to astronauts. Completing tasks once thought to be impossible in an environment that simply cannot support human life. Shackleton's earlier failed expedition on the Nimrod had been the closest anyone had gotten to the pole before Amundsen, and he was still known as a hero. After all, he is Sir Ernest Shackleton. If he can command a crew of explorers in the Antarctic, then of course he can command the respect of high society. For this next part of our story, I like to picture just about any cheesy action movie. We cut to our hero sitting at the table with three of these high and mighty aristocrats, who aren't quite on board as investors. Shackleton is leaning back in his chair, calm and collected, as he explains his plan with maps and models, explaining how the funding he acquired would be used to pay for two ships, the first of which is named Endurance, on which he and his crew would travel to Antarctica. The second of which, named Aurora, would sail to the opposite side of the continent and travel south towards the pole to leave supply drops en route of the expedition and eventually help with the party's return journey. The plan would also therefore require two crews to sail on these ships, consisting of 28 men per ship and supplies for these men. At this point, the investors would be starting to believe this could be done, but one would remain skeptical. He would point out that those waters are full of hard ice flows, a death sentence, and that you would have to be mad to willingly join this crew. And Shackleton would smile. This is where we are introduced to the rest of our main cast of characters, smash-cutting names with a quick backstory. There's Frank Wilde, the second-in-command, who Shackleton would explain had been a member of his earlier expedition teams, and earned his trust and friendship. Frank Worsley will be appointed the captain of the Endurance, which Shackleton would undoubtedly say he fits the doubtful investor's claim that you'd have to be mad to volunteer to sail in these rough waters, as Worsley came to Shackleton claiming to have had a dream of navigating between icebergs drifting down Burlington Street. So naturally, the next day he went to Burlington and saw Shackleton's advertisement. Taking this as a sign, mere minutes later, he had the job. Then there's carpenter Harry McNish, who said he was attracted by the advertisement. And while he was a well-respected carpenter, Shackleton did state that he was the only man I'm not dead certain of. These three men, along with Shackleton and 24 others, would make up the crew of the Endurance, and secure the investment from our lofty skeptic. Now, all that was left was putting this meticulously crafted plan into action. On December 5th, 1914, the Endurance departed a whaling station in South Georgia Island towards the Antarctic. Despite warnings from the whalers that the waters were full of pack ice, making navigation difficult. After only two days, the ship's progress would already be slowed by having to maneuver around this ice and a week after that, was thick enough to stop the ship for a full 24 hours. 
After losing a full day of travel, you have to imagine how frustrating it would be for Shackleton and the crew when only three days later they are stuck again. Shackleton had even referred to the sea conditions as evil and went on to further complain that he was hoping at least the ice would be loose. However, it was instead an obstinate character. On January 15th, 1915, over a month after the ship left port in South Georgia, they finally had reached a suitable landing spot. However, Shackleton declared that it would be too far north. He wanted to make as much progress south as possible on the ship before having to make the remaining trek on foot. However, as a gale wind developed, he would start to regret that decision. These arctic winds would force the Endurance and his crew to take shelter behind a berg. They eventually would leave this protection and once more enter the pack ice. However, this time the ice was different from the hard ice they had encountered previously. This was very thick, but soft ice. I'm going to break the immersion of our story for one moment, just to explain what happens next. While researching everything I could find about this journey, I created a timeline with key dates to help me organize and lay out how I wanted to write this. What happens next, I could find no exact date for, because it happened slowly over several days. So all the reference material just listed it as happening in January. While I can't give a specific date, I can say that it appears to have happened between the time of two events that take place on January 18th and the 24th. What happened during these six days was that the gale winds had pushed the soft ice against the hull of the ship, compressing it and hardening the ice until the ship was lodged firmly in what appeared to be an endless floor of ice on all sides. On the 24th of January, the crew's hope to be able to continue their progress was restored when they noticed the ice ahead of them cracking. This, combined with the direction of the wind changing, gave them new hope that it would be enough to free them. Unfortunately, the wind was too inconsistent and light, with an unusually cold temperature, which meant that even with full sails and the engine at full speed for three hours, no progress had been made. The crew of the Endurance would remain trapped in the ice, patiently waiting for another opportunity. I want to take a moment to slow down the pacing of our story, so you, dear listener, get to fully understand just how soul-crushing this waiting would become. That was only 15 seconds of silence, apart from the icy winds that haunted the crew. Those bitter cold seconds would add into minutes, then into hours, still looking out at the ice, hoping. As night falls, you think surely tomorrow will be the day. Then that day passes as well, still no sign of the ice breaking apart. Then another day, and another, still just waiting, watching, hoping, But as days turn into weeks, your hope turns to desperation. It has to come soon, right? This is the state the crew is in, not knowing what's to come, if and when they'll get to leave this frozen nightmare. Thankfully, Captain Frank Worsley was good at keeping the morale high for the crew. He was known for often getting the men to laugh as he took a snow bath out on the ice. In the inescapable icy landscape, he offered a small but necessary distraction. Worsley also was still tracking the ship's movements, as even though they were trapped in ice, the ice itself is still drifting. He could map out their path and even start to predict where they were headed. Three weeks go by before they get a shimmer of hope again. A quarter mile ahead of them, a channel opens up and with the daylight, they can tell that the ice around them is relatively thin, at only 2 feet thick instead of the 12 to 18 foot thick ice in the area. The crew got to work chipping away a path to the channel, picking and sawing at the pack ice. The whole day into the night, 
and into the next morning was spent creating a narrow path leading to the channel. Full force ahead, the Endurance raced, trying to break its way through the ice towards freedom. By 3 p.m., they had made it 200 yards, only a third of the distance they needed. At this point, the ice was starting to harden around the ship again. Shackleton made the call. They would not continue this fight for freedom. The possibility of damaging and losing the ship would spell doom for all of them. Not to mention the amount of manpower and precious coal this futile attempt had cost. Using more of the fuel could devastate their chances of making the return journey home if they had continued. They were forced to continue to drift along in the ice, waiting again. But Shackleton had a plan. After talking with Captain Worsley about their movements in the ice flow, Shackleton knew of another expedition that had experienced a similar issue and drifted north for six months until they reached the point where the ice had broken apart and they could freely move and sail back. He figured they could wait out the winter as they slowly drifted towards freedom and was even considering resupplying in South Georgia to make a second attempt in the next Arctic spring. This time weeks turned into months, February turned to March, then April, May, June into July. All the while, the ship encased in ice slowly crept north. During these months, the routine of the ship at sea was abandoned. The interior was converted into winter living quarters for the crew. The dogs were taken off board and kept in ice kennels, or dogloos as the crew referred to them as. Shackleton also focused on maintaining the morale and the fitness of the men. He encouraged activities such as exercising the dogs, walking in the moonlight, and even performing theater on the main deck. On July 14th, a terrible storm hit the crew, with temperatures as low as negative 33 degrees Fahrenheit and wind speeds of roughly 70 miles an hour. The wind chill caused by this storm would feel like negative 78 degrees Fahrenheit and is cold enough to cause extreme frostbite in mere minutes. While the crew hid away securely in the endurance, this fierce storm raging outside would cause the pack ice to break apart and create smaller ice flows. This may at the surface sound like good news for those poor souls. However, these ice flows moving independently of one another would violently crash together. These colliding forces threaten to crush the ship at any moment. The ever-looming threat would haunt the crew. Every time they heard the ice crack and break, having to wonder if the endurance and their hopes of sailing home safely would be crushed next. Shackleton had even instructed Frank Worsley to be prepared to abandon ship quickly if needed with supplies ready, saying that the ship can't live in this skipper. But still, the Endurance lived up to its name as it clung to the ice that would mean to crush it. Through the rest of July, through many storms and close calls in August, even making it through September. By the end of September, though, signs of spring could be seen, with 10 hours of sunlight, which would also mean higher temperatures, occasionally even reaching a point above freezing. This could be it. This could mean Shackleton and his crew are almost free. The ice would start to thaw and loosen up and the Endurance could finally break free of its icy prison. At this point, the wooden ship was starting to show worrisome signs from the constant pressure it had been under throughout these long months. A large flow had pushed up against its bow on the port side and pressed the ship tightly to the built-up ice and snow on its starboard. Our carpenter, Harry McNish, even reported that the solid oak beams supporting the upper deck had been bent like a piece of cane. Even in its injured state, the Endurance kept fighting. 
The ship had been opposing the pressure of the ice flows consistently for almost four months at this point. Then the crew's worst fears became reality. On October 24th, another round of pressure waves from the merciless ice flows forced the ship against the hard ice until the hull began to splinter and lead in water. The crew fought to pump the water out with the small portable pumps, but the larger pumps on the main deck had frozen and were unable to be used. Still, the crew worked tirelessly, fighting to keep their hope for salvation afloat. The men were switching between two groups every 15 minutes, working as hard as they could to pump out the cold water, then resting for 15 minutes while the second group worked. Then the first was back to work, fighting against the endless sea of water as it tried to swallow the endurance. The crew struggled like this for a continuous 28 hours. Shackleton made the call to have supplies and the lifeboats taken off of the ship and placed on the surrounding ice. On the 27th, he gave the order to abandon the Endurance. Even after this order, the Endurance still clutched to the ice, its inside slowly flooding with freezing water and snow. The crew were now forced onto the ice surrounding what was once their greatest hope for survival and watched as the ship slowly submerged and drowned, a process that would take almost a month before it was completely swallowed under the water and hidden under the sheets of ice. Fortunately, this meant they could continue to salvage what supplies they could access, including some of the photographer's plates. These photos, along with their scientific findings, would be taken with the crew for their entire remaining journey and handled with meticulous care, as this was now the only hope Shackleton had to pay off the investment for the journey. Refocusing on survival, Shackleton needed a new plan, so after consulting with Frank Worsley to determine their current position, he decided that their best option was to try and march 200 miles, heading for Robertson Island while pulling the boats. One of the orders Shackleton gave to prepare the men for this grueling task was to kill the weaker animals, including the cat of carpenter Harry McNish. This was an act that McNish would never truly forgive. Then, two lifeboats were placed on sleds so the crew could pull them along without risking any damage. After three days of struggling, I imagine the whole crew was depressed to find they had made progress of somewhere between one and a half and two miles of the 200 estimated for their journey. With the endurance still looming over them, they decided to set up camp on the ice and continue to put their fate in the hands of the moving ice flows. Some of the crew made the relatively short trek back to the Endurance to salvage wood, a third boat, and other supplies for the camp, which would get the nickname Ocean Camp. I'm sure this name was the result of overwhelming positivity, resulting in a burst of creativity from the crew. Their future was looking pretty grim at this point. Their best shot at surviving was slowly sinking less than two miles away. They had been stuck in this ice for about 11 months at this point. They had to put down some dogs and a cat. And all this wasn't helped by the fact that the movement of the ice flow is too slow to be recognizable to the men. So they just have to take Worsley's word that they are currently moving at about 7 miles per day. They stayed at this camp almost a month, until Shackleton decided that they would once again attempt to march across the ice. On December 23rd, the crew set to work again at pulling the lifeboats across the ice. But with temperatures above freezing, the men would sink to their knees in the softer snow. So Shackleton decided that the trek would be made at night hoping that the colder temperature would give them a little firmer ground to work on. By December 27th, Harry McNish had had enough. He blatantly refused Shackleton's orders, refusing to work, and even attempted to turn some of the crew against him 
by stating that when the endurance went down, so did Admiralty Law. Accounts vary as to how Shackleton managed to convince McNish to get back to work, ranging from reading out loud a special clause that was added to their journey's contract, still binding them to his orders, threatening to shoot McNish if he didn't get back to work, or that after venting his frustrations, McNish realized that he could not survive on his own. Whatever method was employed, McNish would eventually continue to work. Two days later, for a total of seven days of dragging the boats through the snow and the cold, the crew had only completed seven and a half miles. Shackleton, remembering McNish's short revolt, realized how futile this effort was and that it could lead to larger morale issues with the crew. And so, called a halt to the effort. Here, the crew would set up another camp and be forced to once again wait for the ice flow to move them north. The newly established camp was given the name Patience Camp and would serve as home for the crew. Again, clearly a very positive and creative group. Through January and into February, the crew waited, and the supplies were starting to dwindle. Seal meat, which had been used to give the crew variety between the supplied rations, was now their main source of food. McNish even recalled smoking until he was sick as an attempt to ward off hunger pains. At this point, Shackleton ordered that all but two teams of dogs be put down as they required an extensive amount of seal meat. February gave way to March and then into April. On April 2nd, Shackleton had the last two teams of dogs also put down. But then, the crew's patience finally was rewarded. At this point, the land was in sight. There were three islands eligible for consideration for the crew to attempt to make the voyage to. Clarence Island, Elephant Island, and Deception Island. Clarence and Elephant Island were both uninhabited, but Deception Island was frequented by whalers and was even said to have a wooden church on the island that could provide timber and shelter for the crew. Deception Island was therefore the most desirable choice. However, it also lay the furthest west from the camp. So Shackleton decided the best course of action would be to attempt to island hop to their destination, starting with Elephant Island. Reaching Elephant Island will still be a struggle. Between it and Patience Camp was roughly 100 miles of raging water and ice. To help give the small lifeboats their best chance at survival, McNish was tasked with reinforcing them, building up the sides to prevent the tall waves from crashing over onto the crew. In the evening of April 8th, the crew was forced into action, as the ice they were camped on suddenly split, leaving them on a much smaller piece of ice. Now in a precarious situation, Shackleton knew they wouldn't be able to survive if this smaller chunk of ice also broke apart. By 1 p.m. the next day, the first of the lifeboats, being led by Frank Worsley, was launched, and an hour later, all three were in the water. The little boats were still surrounded by ice, and at the mercy of the ice flows. Often the crew would tide or haul the boats onto nearby ice to rest for the night after a day of inconsistent progress. Now, with little food, and the men getting regularly soaked with the frigid water splashing over the side, the crew was grim. This is also where our Captain Frank Worsley showed his remarkable ability. He was navigating the ships through the treacherous water while keeping them on their desired path to Elephant Island. On the last four nights of this journey, he stayed awake for 90 hours consecutively. On the final night of the journey, the three lifeboats became separated. The already exhausted Frank Worsley stayed awake that entire night, navigating his boat to the island quickly as it had started to take on water. In the morning, he was relieved from steering the boat by one of the crew members, 
and immediately fell into such a deep sleep that he could only be forced awake by being kicked in the head. The boats were quickly reunited and found a suitable landing spot on the island. It's now April 15th, and this was the first time the crew had been on land in 497 days. Even the land here was far from hospitable. Elephant Island is rocky, uninhabited, and unforgiving. The landing showed signs that high tide would engulf the camp if they continued to stay here. So early the next day, Frank Wilds took a small crew to circle the island in search of a landing suitable for a more permanent camp. Which they found, seven miles away. So the crew boarded back into the small boat and made the trek to what would be home of their newest camp. Here the party could survive off of meat from seals and penguins, as well as seaweed, but they would not find rescue from this island. If they wanted to be rescued, they would have to set off and get help. Shackleton's original plan of island hopping to Deception Island had to be reconsidered after seeing how difficult the journey to Elephant Island had been, and recognizing that this new journey would be going against strong winds. Shackleton decided that the best course would be to attempt to make the longer 800 mile journey to South Georgia Island. Their greatest hope at making this crossing would be to reinforce the strongest of the lifeboats and split into two groups. One would stay on Elephant Island while the other attempted this treacherous journey. McNish was tasked with modifying one of the lifeboats using wood from the two others, canvas, and a sealer made with a mix of seal blood, oil paint, and flour. Of the 27 men, five would join Shackleton on this boat, including Worsley for navigation and McNish to make repairs if necessary. Shackleton, remembering the insubordination that McNish previously displayed, was also concerned about the morale for the rest of the crew if he was left with them. Wilde would stay behind and lead the rest of the men until Shackleton could return with a rescue. Should he not return by spring, they would attempt to make the journey to Deception Island. The modified boat was then loaded with supplies for four weeks. As Shackleton determined that if they did not succeed in that time, then the boat would be lost. The lifeboat departed on its long, perilous journey on April 24th. The 100-mile journey to Elephant Island is described as treacherous and miserable, and it would seem like a cakewalk compared to what the small crew of the lifeboat was now undertaking. Not only was the distance eight times further, but the 22-foot boat was going to enter the open ocean, with larger waves throwing the small craft to and fro like a children's toy. In the midst of bracing against these waves, Worsley was going to have to try and take readings with the sexton to be able to navigate them to their destination correctly. If in the waves his calculations are even slightly off, they could miss the island, which would mean certain death for those on the lifeboat and most likely those waiting on Elephant Island. The towering waves throwing around the boat were said to be the largest Shackleton had seen in his 26 years of sailing, but Worsley held tight to the mast, occasionally being supported by the other crew, taking those crucial readings and set their course for the west side of the island. This is so that, with the wind blowing northeast, they could somewhat course correct if necessary. The small crew would also have to attempt to chisel off ice that was slowly forming around the boat. Otherwise, the added weight would slowly build and drag the boat with all of them in it under. This was a difficult task in the rough conditions and held a high risk of being thrown overboard. But the boat and the men persisted. After two full weeks of this torment, they could barely make out their goal 
peeking up from the foggy horizon. Even with the island in sight, it took them another two days due to a storm with hurricane force winds. The cove of the island was littered with hard rocks that threatened to smash the small craft if they were not careful. That same storm would result in the sinking of a much larger 500 ton steamer that was crushed against the rocks on another part of the island. After the storm had passed and the waters were relatively calm, they could carefully land on the beach. Here the crew would find drinkable water from a nearby stream and shelter in a cave. They would spend a week resting here, rebuilding their strength to try and make it to a whaling station. After seeing the condition of the sea and the weakened state of the men and the battered lifeboat, Shackleton decided that it would be best not to risk another voyage and instead they should hike the 22 miles to the nearest whaling station. Although Shackleton knew the island and roughly where the station would be, at this time the center of the island that they would be required to cross was unexplored, mountainous, and held unknown dangers. It became clear that McNish and two of the other crew members had become too weak to make this trek, so the crew would again divide into two parties, leaving them at the cave temporarily until they could return with help. Let's leave our hero here a moment and return to those stranded on Elephant Island, waiting once more but not knowing of their friend's progress, wondering if the lifeboat survived another day or if they were waiting for help that was never going to come for them. Their first priority was creating some rudimentary form of permanent shelter. But without a carpenter like McNish, and only using improvised tools, they had little options. They ended up creating a makeshift hut by overturning the two remaining boats, and, with the addition of canvas, they were turned into effective shelters from the harsh weather. Wilde estimated that help would come for them within the month, and declared that stocking of supplies would be a defeatist mentality. As the week slowly passed, he realized he needed to set routines to help break up the tedious waiting. The crew would rotate activities between keeping a permanent lookout for their rescue, cooking, hunting parties, and even concerts were held every Saturday. This is what life would look like for an unknown amount of time. Either their rescue would come, or they would have to try and set out themselves once more into the sea. Back with Shackleton, the new group of three are getting ready to attempt to cross South Georgia Island. They would start this massive undertaking on May 19th, with a map of the island only showing the coastline. Their destination was this station called Stormness, which, ironically, is the same whaling station that the Endurance and his crew had started this journey from. The route that they would choose to travel in was largely based on random speculation, and, much to their dismay, would often result in having to backtrack due to impassable obstacles. By night, they were so exhausted that rather than attempting to climb down a mountainside, they used rope to create a makeshift sledge and attempted to slide down. Which, surprisingly, worked! It was a 1,000 foot sled ride, and they're going to get back up and keep walking. They would still continue to march through the snow under the moonlight, refusing to rest. The 22 mile hike turned into a 36-hour marathon, climbing and struggling through the ice and snow. But the next morning, they hear the sound of salvation, in the form of a whistle. This was the first man-made sound that was not caused by them that they had heard in almost two years, and it marked the start of the workday at their destination, the whaling station. The three continued their descent to the nearby station, including having to climb down a frozen waterfall. 
When they reached the station, they were taken to the manager, who, although Shackleton had met with when the Endurance last docked here, the manager could no longer recognize what the man had become. The three were given a hot bath and a large meal at the station before Worsley set off on a ship to collect the other three on the island. That same night, a terrible blizzard hit the island, which would have likely killed the group if they had still been struggling to cross the station. During this time, Worsley was able to shave for the first time on this journey, and the next day, when they reached the cove to recover McNish and the other two crewmates, the three were unable to recognize the man in front of them without the grizzled and frozen beard. Even once the group had reached the station, and word of the expedition's fate had been relayed to Britain, finding a suitable ship to rescue those back on Elephant Island was not easy, as the majority of the British ships were currently needed at the war front for the now ongoing World War. Along with some volunteers from the station, the group attempted to make it to the island, but was stopped by the ice. It would take Shackleton four attempts and three months to reach the island after pleading with the Chilean Navy to let him use one of their ships. Let's jump back to our crew on Elephant Island. It's now well past Wilde's one-month prediction, and his policy of not stockpiling food has become one he regrets. By August 23rd, the island is surrounded by pack ice, making a rescue near impossible and they are almost out of food entirely. Penguins are no longer coming ashore, making hunting impossible. He begins to plan to attempt to make the journey to Deception Island. One last push, with all the hopes that just maybe a whaling ship will find them. He plans to leave on the 5th of October due to their dire situation. On August 30th, Shackleton finally reaches the island, and the campsite, and the crew is still there. The entire crew is now saved. What a harrowing journey this has been. But I promised whiskey. Do you remember, at the very beginning of this story, when I mentioned his previous attempt to reach the South Pole? On the Nimrod, where he tried to use ponies? Well, on that expedition, Shackleton brought with a supply of 25 cases of McKinley's rare old Highland malt whiskey. And over a century later, frozen underneath his camp, three of these cases were found intact. Eventually, Richard Patterson, who has been in the whiskey industry for over 50 years and is a master at the art of blending, was able to study these bottles as well as their contents and set out to recreate his flavor for others to experience. And that is what made me buy my first bottle of whiskey. Thank you for joining me on this expedition. I think I'm going to enjoy a glass of Shackleton now. On the rocks, cold as I can get it. I hope you'll join me for more stories in the future, but for now, I'm Ryan Heinzen, and this has been the spirit of Shackleton. In the next episode of The Spirit Of, we enter the story of outlaws on the run and the lawmen pursuing them in the wild west of Arizona, complete with poker, a gunfight, and of course, whiskey. I'll see you there.